challenged, maybe tired, maybe energized, and we're excited to hear more about your experiences in the report out section that's going to come out in a second, and, and Olga will explain all of that. But before we dive into the conversation, I want to take a moment to correct an omission I made earlier. Normally we would do this at the top of the day, but I did not. And while no harm was intended, that does not mean harm was not caused. And for that, I apologize. I welcome all of you to join me in taking a moment to reflect on the space that we are in. Though you can probably tell <laughs> from the architecture of this beautiful school that Princeton is very, very, very old. We know, of course, that long before this school was built or this town was settled, that this land today was and is the traditional lands of the Lene Lenape people. We acknowledge these original caretakers and pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and future. Thank you. No LTC convening can happen without a team. You've heard us mention the folks who spent so many hours planning this symposium. Anne Garcia Romero, Brian Herrera, Migdalia Cruz, Carla Delegada, Gwendolyn Alker, Gina Sandy Diaz, Olga Sanchez, Georgina Escobar, Amparo Garcia Crow, and Christina Leon. Let's give them a quick round of So happy and proud to work with them. And this circle, championed by the folks who you, that you heard spoke earlier in the opening ceremonies, made up the Fornes Symposium Programming Committee, which is one of the many committees inside of a Latinx Theater Commons Steering Committee. While the LTC may have started in 2012 with a small group of eight practitioners and our partners at HowlRound, we have grown to include over 100 past and current volunteer steering committee members a community of over 3,000, and this gathering here today is our eighth convening in the past four and a half years. With the leadership of our partner HowlRound, we have grown into a movement of people using a commons-based approach to transform the narrative of theater in the United States. Anyone who wants to participate in the commons already is, simply because you showed up here and stated your intention. A commons is a resource owned by no one that benefits everyone, and in a commons we all manage the resources for the betterment of our whole community. Our community is an ever-changing thing, constantly shifting and overlapping, repelling and attracting. Our community changes every day, depending on who shows up in the room. Today, in this moment, our community is dictated by all of you. Thank you for coming for bringing yourselves, and for bringing all of your communities from back in your hometowns into this room with you. And thank you for trying to build a community here with us. As we always have to do, we want to take a moment from the LTC perspective to thank a few folks. Uh, two of our major funders, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We have to thank the amazing team at HowlRound, who is live streaming this, who supports us, who will be writing more content next week, so you can read about it. And we also want to thank the team at the Lewis Center for the Arts here at Princeton, including the amazing faculty, staff, student volunteers, student workers, venue managers. They have been amazing, so I want to give them a round of applause. Thank you for hosting us in your home. All right, so we're ready to begin, yes? Okay, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Olga Sanchez. Oh. I'm modeling something, which is not just my shawl, but it is coming down this way. Oh, uh, yeah, and then this way. Like Abigail is going that way. Is this step up here? But that one's a little bit steeper, and I model that because you may be coming up this way, and it actually might be smoother to do that. Yeah. So hi, everybody. How you feeling? <laughs> yeah, me too. I, you know. um, what an amazing day, and I add my personal thanks. And um, we're not done. This is the. 
moment of us coming back together and sharing and being together. So, in addition to sharing what happened today, I'm inviting us, it's not just a report out, it is a, a new conversation that's beginning here in this moment. So yes, we're reflecting, but also this is a dialogue and everybody is welcome to participate, but we will begin by asking a representative from each of the different sessions, the cafecitos, the workshops, the performances, uh, one person from each of those to please come up and take a seat. Uh, some of you know, have already decided, and if not, just, yeah. Perfect, thank you, Kusi. Please, 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 please. Yeah, excellent. Everybody will get a chance, just, you know. Perfect, beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. You're going to write something and share it. <laughs> Which, does, does everybody have like this desire to write all of a sudden or draw, right? Like, why are we talking? <laughs> please. please. Please, 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 please. Somebody from every group. Um, what were the different groups? We, I know we had, um, we have Amparo represented. What group were you in? Um, Translating cafecito. I think we had a pedagogy cafecito. Pedagogy cafecito. We had um, uh, Anne had a workshop. Anne had a writing I'm workshop. For Anne. I'm from oh, you're from Anne. Okay, so Amparo's workshop. Again, the Amparo's workshop. Beautiful. Sorry, what? Well, mic. Mics, mics. Oh, okay. I'll do the mics. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody from the Blue Danube. Blue Danube and the documentary. Documentary, thank you so much. Well done, here for Josefina. Josefina, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, let's see. So we've got... We've got Anne, we've got Amparo. So, uh, Blanca, would you... Be willing to come up and report from your group, and then beautiful. And I'm here for Daniel. Daniel, is it? And that's our group, yeah. I believe it might be. A, you might have more chairs. So, anybody else want to come? Anybody well, feel like just like I really want to? Well, start let, me just, that, let me just add the sort of the idea of the extra chairs. This is a mix of the fishbowl tradition and the round ta long table tradition. So it's like this uh, a conversation among the folks at the table, but then there's always seats at the table for folks to fill in. So if there, there's going to be a couple of these empty seats, so if you feel called to fill one, that's where you follow the, the glorious shawl, shawl procession and join us on the stage. And if there's no seats here, but you really want to say something, just come up and maybe delicately tap someone and they will graciously step aside and let you take a seat at the conversation. This is for everyone to speak. That's why we invite you to, to be here. So here's the, here's, a, here's the opening kind of idea. Just by way of launching, if there were one word, and folks who have the mics, and please speak into the mics because this is being recorded so you'll have to just like pass mics around. But if you had one word or one phrase to describe your session, what, or what you emerged from that to here now, because it is about where you are now, what would that word be? Um, so I saw the beautiful documentary um, about uh, me, and I would say I walked out there with a sense of family. Um, Um, negotiation. Um, I'm speaking 
what is the truth? <laughs> I'm just thinking of the overall experience of my new friends. And, uh, you know, I taught a workshop, but I think after teaching the workshop, I realized that what she brought to me was this, uh, she owned this space for a feminine process to take place. Because I feel that oftentimes theater is such a masculine place. Uh, since it's dominated by men, that then she brought the spend and process to demand it is proper place. And, uh, and, and as a result of doing with that, I, I feel the catharsis that that process is. I'm here to be speaking uh, on behalf of the performance of The Danube that was offered by the Actors Studio and the conversation that followed. And I think the word that resonated uh, so much through that was two things was trust and intuition. Beautiful. Um, so to begin the idea of uh, what, what I'm hearing, are, and I'm going to repeat them, I'm curious about where you feel, having heard these words that have just emerged, where you find resonance, where you find counterpoint, where you say, oh yes, also that, also that, and how you respond to these words. Family, negotiation, nourishment, clarity, producing lesser well-known works, difficulty, possibility, introspection, truth, catharsis and femininity, and truth, trust. 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 I definitely think trust is a very powerful word because as a result of being in the writing workshop, I trusted the, the images. That's, that's the theme of my workshop was to trust the images that are false. And I feel that as a result of starting out with that foundation, I was able to write very bold work. So trust really empowers you to be bold to tell the truth. What was like the third or fourth word? You bet. Uh, nourishment? Nourished, okay, family, negotiation, nourished or nourishment, clarity. Was that unconscious? Clarity in the unconscious? Producing lesser well-known works, active. Difficulty, possibility, um, introspection, truth, feminine process and catharsis, and trust. <laughs> Not wrong, sorry. Uh, counterpoint, resonance. It's perfect, go with what? Yeah. Use it. Where you are. <laughs> um, maybe it was something that, that had to do with a uh, counterpoint. Was that what it was? Oh, yeah. then it, it was a counterpoint. Um, because it, it was interesting um, to see sort of the different point of views. I mean, that's the thing that I, I always tend to, uh, I'm attracted to, um, that everything isn't always gray, but that there are blacks and whites. Um, and it's always interesting to me to hear other people's experiences. And I know for me, because I was speaking of my own personal experiences, um, making sure that it was like, oh, but this is just my experience. And everyone else's is equally valid, whatever that is, whether it's an, an opposing experience, uh, quite different, uh, one that's similar. But um, even sometimes when experience, we share the same thing, the points of view are different, uh, how we feel about them are different and they are certainly all equally valid. And that was something that um, we spoke about a lot in sharing um, our experiences as actors, uh, as uh, creative people, writers, performers. So I, I, I loved uh, being able to hear other people's points of view. Uh, so I said family because um, watching that country, uh, the rest kind of thing up, so if you want to see it, now you should be able to do that for it. Also,
is um, that if you uh, belong to some kind of institution, that your institution should get a copy of this. Um, and so get, get this. Um, and so that your institution has this, so there's no excuse why anyone at your institution, whether it's a university or arts organization, doesn't know about this program. Um, I would have another word, stealth. So I thought of Brian's book.
just open my brain up to, you know, as soon as you write something, you don't need to immediately judge it and then start to shape it. You can also just let it manifest itself and continue to receive the message and the image and let it become clearer versus turning it into, okay, how is this going to look in the world? Who's going to judge this? Who's going to see this? Is this going to make sense to anybody besides me? And that can get you trapped into a box very easily as a playwright, a place I think I've been recently. So just hearing that, it's okay to spend time receiving, was like, I will take that away forever. Um, one of the threads that really came through very profoundly in those things that Stella Carson from the Actors in the Actors Studio talked about their process with the Danube was uh, the, um, their, their, the affirmation that so much of what was needed for stage in that production was I mean, and put upon the paper in front of us. And one of the things that I, like I said, it's all there, you just have to listen to it. And one of the things that has been very striking for me throughout the process to the symposium, but also throughout the process of the day, in, and like I said, I, I uh, did not work with Irene directly, and I only met her in the last few years where she lived, after she moved to where she currently lives. But what I've experienced, and I keep seeing this, is Teach her capacity to be the grand teacher remains active and present and available. Sometimes in her words on the page, sometimes in her words on the screen in Michelle Stone, but it's also in process. And for me, it's been a thing of beyond either of those things. It's been a thing of my trusting that this symposium would work and we had to go about it in a very Cornishian associative way for it to work. We had to have it be not a normal symposium, which made people confused. You know, like, am I speaking on a panel? It's like, no, we have no panels. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's a symposium. I said, no, it's a foreign symposium. There are no panels. <laughs> and so it's this thing of how we continue to learn. This is going, I think, tuning into what I heard Gwendolyn say. How do we continue to learn with one of the 20th, 20th century's greatest whose lessons are still available to us, and in our community, we have access to the people who learn with her. So how can we keep those lessons moving? How can we keep those lessons alive? And how can we learn the lesson we haven't been listening to all this time? While the mic is being passed, I want to re-invite anyone to come up and share their response. Um,
work that's written by a playwright who, it, who chose to write in English, but she couldn't have written in Spanish, and the translator had it in Spanish, and the performer might have it, but doesn't actually speak Spanish. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, the kind of intersectional meanings and, and, and roots and kind of liberties of all of that. And then I also realized that I was sitting in a room at, at, at Princeton University where um, Just come up. Okay. <laughs> Is it there's chairs? Recently, I, um, I went to Gala Theater in D.C. 
and met with Hugo and Rebecca Medrano, um, who are the founders and who run that beautiful theater. And, um, and it made me think of Jose Gonzalez and Daniel Malan, and Luis Valdez and Lupe Valdez, and um, Jose Luis Valenzuela, um, and Evelina Fernandez. Uh, and I'm sure there's more and more, but there's something about that family thing and their children. Uh, and, and I just want to echo that because it's been on my mind. Should we bring the mic out to you? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh-oh, sorry. Yeah, I, it's okay, Denise. I was with the Chair of the Republican Group in the and there's more open them. Um, because to me, that was a beautiful um, summary of the invisible. It always came and comes into the room when you find her very important and her inspiration because it's that whatever your own language that is, or the world plays, or soft and pure book plays, or the empty state. And I love that she holds that. And if you were talking, I think about, it's like, what? Well, Intuitive, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Amparo.
spring, and then I also plan with my active concentration students to have a reading and hopefully at the paper center for writing. And so I'm just really feeling um, by today and excited and moved. Thank you. Welcome up Cynthia DePure, who has a special announcement for us. Uh, I want to, in the spirit of the moment, a thought that came to mind listening was trusting, and I'm grateful for the nourishment that I've received, that we've been speaking about, in the invisible fountain that is flowing within all of us with truth. So, Cynthia DeCure. Marisa Chivas uh, could not be here today, but we are collaborating on Celebrando Fornes, uh, Celebrating Fornes, which calls upon universities and colleges and theaters in the United States to celebrate the work of a Maria, uh, Maria Irene Fornes, and in the uh, season of 1920, in the theater season of 1920. Um, these, uh, these are the participating schools that so far have signed up to either do a, uh, a reading, produce a play, bring film, uh, in the year 1920. 2020. 2020, the, the season of 1920. Oh, Academic year of 1920. Uh, not another year 19. 2019, 2020. There we go. Got it right. So these are the participating schools. Uh, Arizona State University, CalArts, California State University Fresno, California State University Long Beach, California State University Stanislaus, Kent State, SMU, UCLA, University of Illinois Champaign, University of Miami, University of Oregon, Yale, and Breath of Fire Theater Company, and 50 Playwrights Project. If you would like to add your university, your theater, to the list, I would be happy to take it, and then we can publish the full list. Thank you.
Okay. In the spirit of a thing that we do at the LTC, at the Latinx Theater Commons, I believe we're going to set up two microphones. Abigail? No, we are not going to set up two microphones. We're going to have one microphone, and this is it. And this is it. And this is it. Where's the other microphone? There's two microphones. And there's a microphone out there. Yeah, so Megan has one, and we have the other. Great. And um, so my question is, because there was a certain comfort, because there was a certain comfort in bringing the mic out there, would that be problematic, or can we keep the mic out there? This is, I mean, the question is... How does that work for you, Stokely? Just stand, stand up. up. Okay. So you can have the mic out there, but please stand up when you take it. So this is the thing. This event, as we mentioned earlier, was born of an intention. So here we are, we're in this. What are we going to do with this? And that answer is individual. It's, it's mine. I, I, don't, I can't articulate that yet. But let's think on it for a second. And we're going to voice it. Um, and I'm going to... Um, invite Brian to be the first to voice because he's had a moment to think about this. <laughs> um, Brian hit it up. So um, once again, thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us here at Princeton today. Um, this is this moment in any LTC convening is one of my uh, one, one, is it one of the kinds of moments that have been most transformative for me personally. It's a moment when we say what our intentions are moving forward, what commitments we're willing to make in full sight and view, what, willings we're, what commitments we're willing to sort of allow the community to lift up and take that bravery, uh, that moment, like to let the community help us be a little bit more brave in saying what we're going to do. I will say that, as I mentioned a little bit this morning, in 2013, when I was at the first national convening of the Latino Latino Theater Commons, what it was then called, um, I knew as I made my commitments that one of my commitments was to this thing that had been named that nobody knew what it was or whether it would be this thing called the Fornes Institute. And I said, I knew in my heart that there was some place for me in that. I also knew that um, I had a sense of obligation to Fornes and a sense that I needed to deepen and understand more deeply that, that feeling. So I said I knew, I didn't know what I was gonna do with the Fortnite Institute, but I figured, okay, I'll put, throw my, throw my, I made that commitment. Uh, uh, two years later, at Chicago, at Carnaval, we had a meeting of the Fortnite Institute, and at that time, I said, okay, in three years, in the spring of 2018, it will be, I know I will still have a job at Princeton then. I knew that. <laughs> And I knew that we were opening this building. And so I said, I think between those two things, I can make this promise. And so I stood up at that meeting that morning in Chicago and I said, um, I can make the commitment that we will have some kind of thing, thing at Princeton in the spring of 2018. Don't know what it is. Maybe we'll call it the, I don't know, the Fornes Symposium. <laughs> And I, I can make sure that that happens. Had I not stood up and made that commitment in front of people I admired and trusted and loved, I might have kept that idea as a glimmer or an inspiration or a thought or maybe something I'll get to one day. But because I chose to name it as an intention that I wanted you to hold me accountable to, it sent me on a journey of discovery and growth and deepening of relationships with people I already knew I loved and discovery and new relationship. It's been an extraordinary journey and I thank the Latin, Latinx Theater Commons and all of you for being here to be part of that process. That's what we do when we affirm our intentions at the end of these meetings. We join with our community to say, I'm willing to take this risk, to lean into this in intuition, to discover this inspiration that is beginning to speak to me and to say, I don't know what shape it's gonna take, but I'm willing to make it real. Join me in that. And so I invite you now to join in that impulse. Whatever impulse you have about dedicating, the Fortnite Institute's mission is to celebrate 
to amplify, to elevate, elevate, to archive, to preserve, to make more visible the living legacy of Irene Fornes. What is your impulse coming out of today? Is there anything you'd like our witness, our support, and our validation as you carry this impulse forward in your own practice and in your own communities? And so this is a time as the microphones pass for you to gather the strength of this community as you take a risk and take a step and build that legacy forward. Thank you. In the spirit of jumping in, um, it doesn't have to be very long for me. Um, I, what comes to mind is I want, I'm committing to writing more courageously. I'm committing to wherever my path takes me because I'm on a transition um, to bringing something of the Irene Fortness Institute to my next institution. Anyone can go. Uh, hi, everybody. So this is partly um, an announcement for the but I just wanted to share with this community that I'm making uh, the old school drama will formally dedicate the room 305 Crown, which is known as Playwright Studio. It will become the Maria Irene Fornes Playwright Studio, and she will join six other uh, honorees in a Naming Spaces initiative at the, at the School of Drama um, to lift up uh, the experiences, the lived experiences, the diverse uh, individuals who have shaped our field and our institutions. Um, and along with that, then I would just like to put an intention of the room to bring back the Fornesian playwriting workshop to the Yale School of Drama in some way.
wanted to bring some of the master teachers to my university because they need to meet the students of the Central Valley of California who do not know her work. And through this initiative of celebrating for uh, they will get to know her work. But they also need, it's like seeds. Thinking, thinking of the Central Valley, it's like seeds is where the food is made. And this is where the seeds are planted and the seeds are working to be planted there so they can proliferate everywhere else. Um, and I commit to owning the fact that I'm a playwright. Uh, 
um, not contractual, I love, I love y'all, I can dance, it's not my vibe, you know? But um, uh, I would love to be with that and allow like money and stuff to do workshops there, and I would love to bring anybody out in for some time and or whoever, whatever, don't feel pressure to come in and do a writing workshop with the, with the students at the call because um, um, they, they greatly need some, some, some inspiration. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Annie Gomez, and I'm the theater conservatory director at an arts and theater school in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, I mainly teach students who are ages 11 to 18, but it does, does go all the way up. And I'm going to commit to having a workshop in the fall that is dedicated to not just Cornette's, but to the uh, playwrights who have been inspired by her. So even our young people, not even in college yet, can experience the work of not just her, but the people that she taught. Um, I'm Lynn Johnson, I'm a playwright. I'm committing myself to improve our community to the fact that my wife is a teacher in the Bronx and for a year she had one of the students that was interested in playwriting and I haven't been able to meet him because, you know, life and stuff. And, uh, and she always said that there's so many women that are interested to write but they're afraid to do it because they don't find anybody to do it. So I'm committing myself every year to pick a student and help them through it. Just the basics and uh, whatever I can do to help them start themselves as playwright or the screenwriter or anything. Hi, I'm Tessa Lazzoni, and most of you know me. Uh, and I interview playwrights for the Playwrights Project. I've interviewed a lot of you. Uh, and so I'm committing to interviewing everyone here who identifies as a playwright. Uh, also, I will say that of the people that um, the inspiration section, Fornes is consistently on there whether it's people that have worked with her directly or people who have been influenced by her work. And so something I've been wanting to do is really map that uh, and create like a visual, you know, family lineage, I guess, of Latinx theater making and playwriting, and so I'm going to admit to doing that. But first, I have to interview everyone. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, come find me after. Hi, my name is Sonia. I'm an actor and producer. I commit to um, finding a space for her work, for her writing workshop during her campaign, which I'm championing, which is in progress. <laughs> um, and through my work for the school project in 2019. Um, I also felt very much like Kat um, when I visited her, um, because I do not know her personally. Uh, but she is one of my inspirations for advocating for aging and older artists, and so I'm going to be seeing.
of uh, Latina, uh, Latina playwrights, uh, including Cornets, and especially based on everything we discussed today, some of the work that has not been presented uh, ever, maybe. Um, so yeah, let's do that. Give me like a year and a half. My name is Scott Cummings. I've been uh, studying Irene's work off and on for 30 years. I first interviewed her in 1985. Uh, it's been a, been a great pleasure uh, to be here with you today. Uh, I've written a lot about Irene in a lot of different ways, uh, and I don't feel like I have very much more that I need or want to say about her, uh, but there is a project that I've been working on off and on for 10, 12 years uh, that I intend uh, to finish. Uh, it involves uh, something related to uh, what Ann mentioned this morning. Uh, in 1985, 86, 87, as Irene became more and more popular and better known as a playwriting teacher, uh, she conceived to write a book, a book which she never completed and never will complete and there is no way that anybody can ever really do the book that she wanted to do. A book that was touching on her playwriting pedagogy. But she'd begun to uh, gather a lot of materials for that book, uh, having some of her uh, class sessions recorded, and some of those things have been transcribed, uh, and I am intending to follow through on gathering as much of that material as I can contextualizing it uh, in various occasional writings, uh, excerpts from interviews that Irene did, uh, and trying to create something that would not be the book that Irene conceived, because nobody can do that. Uh, and as some people have mentioned, uh, Irene was a very, is a very oral person. Uh, she taught uh, in the present uh, through speaking language, and so any kind of written book that presents her dramaturgy, her pedagogy, can't really do it the way Irene would do it. Uh, but I intend to try to do some approximation of that, uh, and I welcome uh, any input that anybody here or in the entire HowlRound community might have uh, in that effort. Thank you. of how 
how these intentions have manifested is that these are not only powerful for those of us who share them um, because they're heard aloud or rather spoken aloud, um, but they are powerful because everyone, at, at the moment of saying them, I know that I am envisioning the things that people have uttered, the workshops, the planting of a tree, the book, um, the productions, and, and it's our imaginations together, I believe, uh, that are part of the, that part of the force that are actually bringing these events, these intentions to reality, to manifestation. I share that by way of welcoming you to share your vision in the few minutes that we have remaining for this process, if you would like. Hi, I'm Ann Garcia Romero. I saw you guys throughout the day today. And I mentioned this morning, I began the Fornish Playwriting Workshop in Chicago through Notre Dame where I'm a professor. And um, I'm, we're doing it again this summer. I didn't mention that deadline to apply is April 23rd coming up. It's gonna be the end of June, early July. But I'm committing here to continue to pursue funding and resources to continue this workshop year in, year out to expand to more classes, more time. We've seen just the beauty of this kind of work. And Notre Dame has been very generous, but I have to expand in the future my funding circle. So I'm committing to keeping this going as long as I can. Hi, my name is Gabby.
I'm Armando, I'm a rising third year MFA candidate in the theater management program at YSD. And next year I'll be the managing director of the Cedar Man Theater Company at the Yale Cabaret. Let's bring the film to the cabaret. Yeah. <laughs> Intentions in our hearts, perhaps not spoken, invisible for now, but visible in the future. And in the spirit of the fountain, the well of inspiration uh, that we honor today, Maria Irena Bornes, um, I, I, I guess I want to propose a toast right, to our intentions, even though we don't have any beverages, so maybe that's an incorrect thing. But just, I, I, I invite us all to say the words, and what came to mind was, to the Fornes Fuente, which means to the Fornes Fountain, yes, or the font, which is, which are, which is running through this and running forward into the future. So, to the Fornes Fuente. Okay, one more time. To the Fornes Fuente. Thank you. And welcome Abigail and Gwendolyn. Okay, friends. Gwendolyn and I are gonna do quick logistics and then we're actually we actually, we're, we're not leaving, so we w would love if you could just stay still. <laughs> we're, not, we're not done, thank you. Not to shame, but we're not done. Um, and then we're gonna bring up, um, we're gonna bring up Migdalia Cruz, who's gonna, who's gonna close us out. Before we have that moment, which I wanna hold, I just need to do like a hot second of logistics. So I'm gonna do mine and then you do yours? Okay, cool. So the only thing I have to say is if you're going to dinner after this in the dining hall, look over where Brian's standing. Over here, over here. Uh, let me introduce you to uh, your guys. There's two hand masters for dinner. So we me right after you guys have a guys presentation on over here. If you're connecting with Tessa, this is Tessa. If you're connecting with Regina, this is Regina. If you're connecting with Karina, this is Karina. And that's Kai. So come on over here. I'll connect you right first. They'll guide you to dinner. They'll guide you to dinner. Thank you, Brian. Okay, we're not done. We're not moving. We're not moving. We're not done. All right, Gwendolyn. Yeah, it's three minutes, y'all. Yeah, super quick. Super quick. I'll be super quick. So, for those of you who are coming tomorrow to the Fornes Colloquium at NYU, please come. Um, and this is really an opportunity to see a completely different community, right, that Irene worked with. We have the, we don't have this, we have scrappy downtown New York City talent. That's what we've got, we don't have this. Um, so two things I just wanted to announce logistically was that first, if you're coming directly from this event and you're very invested in taking the dinky, it's gonna be tough because the dinky first leaves here at 919 from Princeton that won't get you into Penn Station till 10.43. The thing starts at 11 with a scholars panel that Scott I and um, Alicia uh, Solomon um, and who else, and Bonnie Maranca are going to be on at 11 a.m. So therefore, if you're coming directly from here, I would recommend that you get the 9.12 train from Princeton Junction and avoid the dinky. Okay, don't do the dinky. We love it, but say no to the dinky. 
So take 912 train. That will get you in at 1035 to Penn Station. I recommend that you walk one block east to the NR downtown yellow line. Take it about three or four stops. It is working at present, I checked. Not to say it'll be working tomorrow, but we'll keep our fingers crossed. The NR downtown train um, at Herald Square, and that will take you to 8th Street, which will be a block above the venue at NYU. Um, second logistical announcement is accessing the venue. Whether you're coming for the 11 o'clock panel or the two o'clock concert reading of Promenade, you will be entering through the, build, the same building. It's a different number, but it's the same entrance. So you'll need to come in at 721 Broadway. On a lot of the promotional materials, it says 715 Broadway. I was informed on Friday at 5 p.m. that the 715 lobby will be locked. However, you can enter it through the 721 Broadway entrance and there will be signs once you get there to go to either to your right, which will be to the scholars panel and the women directors panel at 4 p.m., or to your left, which will be to the concert reading of Promenade at 2 p.m. So that's just what I want to say. Take 721 Broadway and all paths will lead from that lobby to your colloquium experience. Thank you very much. I know, it's like, do we clap, do we not clap? I just want to say, first off, I have three tickets. Three tickets exist for tonight's show. I am in fifth grade, you are in kindergarten. Come find me, I will give you, that's it. There's three tickets in the world left, but I have them. Also, if you don't know where you're going for dinner, quickly run over there when we're done so I can tell you where, because I have a list, or I'll come find you. Um, let's take a breath together. It's been an amazing day. Thank you for the privilege of, of being able to, to work with Princeton and to host this event. And I want to welcome Migdalia Cruz to close us out. a song for Irene. On my way to see Irene, I start to feel the sting of tears behind my eyes, but I push them away by imagining dancing around her and with her, all of us, all wearing red. This makes me laugh. I arrive at the nursing home at 12.30 p.m. and walk down the antiseptic hall to find Irene alone in her little room number 419. I walk in and she is clean, quiet, reclining in a chair, like a painting by Fernand Leger, a reconstructed classic, whose hands have turned in on themselves, nails too long. Note to self, bring a manicure kit next time. She's wrapped tightly in a handmade afghan of white, beige, green, and red, her sharp fingernails peeking out from holes in the blanket. Seems like colors left over from other knitting projects. Who would put those together, I think? But on Irene, they look comfy. A coat of many odd, warm colors. I fight the urge to thrust a pencil in her hand and a piece of paper in front of her. In my mind's eye, she's always writing, but she doesn't remember how to write. I am writing a song for Irene in the hazy warmth of the Amsterdam nursing home. In Irene's room, I choose the playlist, Astor Piazzolla, Compay Segundo, and Edith Piaf. Then we move to the dining room where, from the radio, Whitney Houston sings, I will always love you, segueing into Ed Sheeran's A Shape of You. I imagine she might like these songs too, but they're not on her true soundtrack. I know this because her hands clutch the blanket more tightly around her. This is my song for you, Irene. I sing of your fierce words, your brutally honest gaze, your ability to use one word to express what takes others a paragraph. You confirm all we know about the world in your work. And that was your work. This is my dream for us today and always, to be witness to Irene's legacy, to be mindful of what she gave us and be grateful. To be grateful for what we give each other and generous with our art. To know the difference between art and avarice and to use our critical eye to help us maintain our own integrity. We must remember those who came before, who are now in the air around us, whose roots hold us steady and help us see the future. 
Irene taught me that to tell the truth is the greatest goal in the theater. In life, it can exist in our heads, but in art, we must speak from our viscera. Be brave, be relentless. Maria Irene Furnes changed the music for all of us. Even as she can no longer get up and change the song, this is your song, Irene, we sing it for you. We hold it close to our chests and imagine your heart in its pulsing glory, leading the music. It's getting late. The cathedral across the street has rays of sun streaming through its stained glass. I watch the tourists climbing the stairs to see Keith Haring's stark stations of the cross or the Baroque Barberini tapestries. I think Irene would have liked those. Though those tapestries, the intricate weaving, the muted colors, I think they would appeal more than the, the herring. Each panel tells a story and all those stories add up. I want to pull all those stories Irene might have written out of her, but no more of these stories. No pencils moving delicately over paper. Irene held a pencil like a paintbrush. Her paintings are her plays, except unlike other paintings, they breathe, they must breathe. We know what happens when the breathing stops. Leaving the nursing home feels like fleeing into exile. From quiet contemplation to punishing pavement, I feel like I have just tumbled out a window. Not enough to end me, but just enough to know what I've left behind. This is my song for Irene. It never ends. It's a song we must all sing. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.